Well, we're at the end of March Madness with the Final Four this weekend, and it's a funny thing about sports such as basketball. When a game ends with the score really close, we tend to notice, I'm going to turn this mic off, and if you all up top would let me use just the pulpit mic. For some reason, there's a short developing in, that, in the connection here. Is that okay? If, if you can't hear me, raise your hand, right? And that's, <laughs> I'm going to trust that you all can hear me well. So as I was saying, we're at the end of March Madness with the Final Four, but it's a funny thing about sports uh, such as basketball. When a game ends and the score is really close, we tend to notice and remember things that happened at or near the end of the game. A buzzer beater shot, a steal taken all the way down the court for a layup either by your team or the opponent, or a missed shot, especially a pair of missed free throws. There's a lot of pressure felt by athletes and imposed on them by fans for what they do at or near the end of the game. We talk about those last minute triumphs or failures often for days afterward, playing them over and over again in our minds, either to our delight or our frustration. If our team loses, we mull over what might have been if only the player hadn't missed that layup or those free throws with seconds left. But the truth is that each such action at the end of the game only has significance because of all that preceded it. All during the game, there were similar actions, seemingly inconsequential at the time, either positive or negative for either team, that when added up, created the situation at the end of the game that seemed so important to the outcome. In other words, without all of those earlier actions, the team wouldn't be in the situation when the individual action of a key shot or a steal or a foul or a missed free throw mattered so much. In other words, the game wouldn't be so close. It also means players of losing teams shouldn't have to carry so much guilt when they make a mistake at or near the end of the game because their teammates contributed to the outcome just as much beforehand by their mistakes. We just don't remember them as well. The same is true in the rest of life. When we get to the end of life here on earth or when our loved ones do, sometimes we can feel remorse or otherwise struggle emotionally with something said or not said at the end or with something missed as we say goodbye. We may want it to all end just right, to have the final thing said be our lasting happy memory of our relationship with our loved one. And that can put a lot of pressure on us and on those whom we love. Now, if something really special happens with a dying loved one or is said in those final hours, well, then that's, that's wonderful. Like a last second three-point shot sealing a win in a basketball game, only much more significant, it can be a blessed memory bringing great comfort to us. But on the other hand, if things don't go so well at the end, and they often don't, because let's face it, death like birth is painful and a complicated process. We ought not to be distraught, therefore, because the interactions with loved ones in their final hours don't mean all that much apart from all that precedes them. All of the laughter over the years, all of the shared experiences, all of the special moments spent together in doing big, exciting things, but also and especially all of the little things that at the time didn't seem all that consequential and probably weren't when added up, paint the full picture of our lives together, of our relationship with our loved ones. How you say goodbye at the end doesn't really matter nearly as much as all that came before, because your relationship, the love you share, is what gives meaning to your life, then and now. Today's gospel lesson from John opens with the disciples huddled behind locked doors on the Sunday evening of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Jesus suddenly appears to his closest followers, offering them peace and showing them the wounds he suffered on the cross. He bestowed on them the power of the Holy Spirit before leaving them. One of the disciples wasn't there, though, Thomas, nicknamed Didymus in Greek or the twin in English. When his friends later told him about their amazing encounter with Jesus, Thomas struggled to believe that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. Was this some kind of joke they were trying to play on him? A cruel one, if so. 
He pushed back by brashly declaring that unless he saw and touched Jesus' wounds himself, he wouldn't believe that he had risen from the grave. A week passes, and then Jesus appears again to his disciples, once more in a Jerusalem house behind closed doors. And this time Thomas is there, and Jesus goes right to him and invites him to touch the wounds in his hands inside and not to doubt, but believe. Doubting Thomas changes instantly into believing Thomas. Now, did you notice something interesting about the scripture? There is nothing there suggesting that Thomas responded to Jesus' invitation by actually touching his wounds. Instead, Thomas proclaims, my Lord and my God. This is one of the greatest declarations of faith recorded in the entire New Testament. How is doubting Thomas suddenly able to make such a profound statement of faith? Well, it's not because he touches Jesus' wounds, obviously, because he doesn't do that, but also not because he sees Jesus either, I would argue. No, I think it's because when he does look at Jesus, standing there in front of him, he's suddenly reminded of all that they had experienced together over the course of the preceding three years. Perhaps he remembered Jesus changing water to wine at the wedding at Cana. Maybe he recalled his telling the man beside the pool of Bethesda to, to take up his mat and walk, and that he did. Or perhaps he could see in his mind's eye Jesus miraculously feeding the 5,000. Or maybe he remembered Lazarus is walking alive out of the grave. Thomas' faith, in my opinion, was made possible by or at least significantly enhanced by his accumulated experiences with Jesus. Added up, they made all the difference when it counted. As in a basketball game, this experience with Jesus at the end, at least the end of his time here on earth, was more than just met the eye. It was also everything that preceded it. Thomas's profound new understanding of who Jesus was, my Lord and my God, was what Thomas could see then only by looking through his collective encounters with Jesus over the prior three years. Now, to tie this all together, here's what it means for you and me. Our faith in Jesus Christ is based on the truth that he died and yet rose from the dead, but our faith exists, or at least is enhanced, by all of the seemingly little things along the way. Our life experiences with Jesus that make our present belief what it is. These are the building blocks of our faith, our, our reading of Scripture and taking in the stories and teachings of Jesus, our prayer life and the personal communion with the living Christ that comes with it, our worship together as in moments like this, and the opening of our hearts and minds to the influence of the Holy Spirit through the practice of other spiritual disciplines. All of these things seemingly perhaps little and inconsequential at the time when added up build our faith and make our belief in the risen Christ possible and vibrant. Our faith is also enhanced by our day-to-day -day experiences, some of them big but most little things in which we see what a difference Jesus makes in our own lives and in the lives of others. In the history of this church, we've witnessed God at work in many ways, such as in the lives of Bill and Alice White, leading to a mission to the people of Haiti now for over 40 years and counting. Look how their hearts were led to make a real difference in the lives of the suffering people of that poor island nation, and how so many of you in this church were likewise inspired to give of yourselves and your resources in the wake of Bill and Alice's initial action of donating the boat that began the mission. Look at what a positive impact the What's Next ministry is having on the young men participating in it, a ministry that's expanding out to new schools and to new lives. Denny Hammock and David Parr responded to a nudge from one of the boys they were coaching in basketball who asked the question, what's next, coach? But really, they were asked that question by God, in my opinion, and they answered with faith. I'm sure in Denny and David's mind, they're coaching that boys' basketball team that first year was nothing more than a little thing for them to do in the grand scheme of things. But look how that one little thing added to many other little things since then has turned into something very big. We just ended room in the inn for the season for four months 
this season under the leadership now of John and Karen Perry. We're offering, we've been offering warm lodging, meals, and hospitality to persons whose very lives may have been saved by the sanctuary provided to them in our church and in others. Our individual actions each Wednesday night from December through March, such as preparing and serving meals or sitting with and talking with our guests or driving them here in the, in the church bus or spending the night with them, may be just little things when considered alone, but four months of those little things accumulate to have a big impact on others' lives. I could go on, but my point is that you and I can look around us and see how Christ is moving among us. And it is through the lens of those encounters, many of them little things, that our faith is nurtured and grows, enabling us, like Thomas, to look to Jesus and say with profound assurance, my Lord and my God. One final word. Here's a question. What is true of the setting both times Jesus appears to the disciples? The doors are locked shut. Jesus comes to his followers, the same bunch that had abandoned him when he was arrested, tortured, and executed. He finds them even though they're huddled behind closed doors, which means that even after the news of his resurrection had made their way, had made it their way by word from Mary Magdalene, the disciples remained timid and afraid. That's not just on the day of his resurrection. It's a week later and the doors are still shut. All of them must have had doubts, not just Thomas. And yet Jesus is undeterred by the closed doors of the house and of their hearts and minds. He meets them where they are physically and spiritually, and Jesus does the same for us. He meets us where we are. So even in the midst of our doubts and struggles with faith, Jesus appears among us. He is unrelenting in his desire to share his love with us and deepen our relationship with him. And the little things along the way <clears throat> that shine a light on the presence of Christ help us to see him clearly as our Lord and our God. Amen.